Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. I am John Beckman, Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman, the father of sin, the transgenic mother of sin, your hostess with the mostess. Raised desk in the front. That's right. Okay. Today we have a very interesting topic that I've been wanting to do for a while. Let me share my screen here. So here we have ChatGPT. I want to know what right now can ChatGPT 3.5 be used for for biotechnologists. So what could a biotechnologist get uh, an advantage from by using ChatGPT? I want to investigate that right now. So I've come up with a series of 11 things that I would theoretically or have wanted to use ChatGPT for to see if it would work. And I'm going to test those theories. Okay. So some of these are from an academic perspective. Some of these are from, a, I guess, a corporate biotechnologist perspective or just like quickly getting information. Okay. So some of these I've already tested and I can already affirm. So I literally just use ChatGPT to write like half of my exams test questions for the next exam. So I know for a fact that ChatGPT can be used already to very easily help professors write test questions. Now, the interesting thing about this from a student perspective is that you know that professors, I wouldn't say that they're lazy, but they're always looking for a way to speed up their pipeline and to reduce the amount of burdensome, um, boring work that they have to do. So you can imagine that lots of professors, if I'm not the only one, a lot of professors are probably gonna be using ChatGPT to write some exam questions. So I ask it a question and then I evaluate it, see if I can get the answer right. And then I see if I agree with its reasoning or not. And about 75% of the questions that it writes, I agree with the rationale and about 25%, I think it's actually wrong. And I overrule it and audit it or edit it or make a different version. But essentially, if professors are using it to write test questions, that means you can also use ChatGPT to help you study. So if you wanna study for an exam, from some professor. You might just make a list of all the things that the professor has talked about in class and you can just ask ChatGPT to ask you or make up a test question about those topics and that's gonna help you to study. And it, it'll tell you the rationale for why each answer is wrong and why each answer is correct. So it's actually a very useful study tool. I find it very useful. Um, Okay, uh, the third thing, assisted grant writing. I've already I've already used this. I've already, and I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I've already written, not written an entire grant, but used ChatGPT to help me fill certain sections. And then I edited those sections and that grant was funded. So I, people are already using ChatGPT, not to write entire grants, but for assisted grant writing, which makes obvious, um, it's obvious. Whether you like that or not, or whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I won't weigh into that now, but it's happening. Okay, now is where there's some other ones that I have yet to try, that I have ChatGPT open right now, and I want to try these things out. Okay, so get the amino acid sequence of a protein. This came up... Um, this came up when a student was asking me for the very specific sequence of a protein and we spent maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes looking online to try to get the sequence of a protein. So let's ask it. Um, can you, and this is ChatGPT 3.5. I tried to upgrade to four. Uh, I'm going to pay for it, but for some reason it wasn't taking my credit card. So during the next few weeks, I'll upgrade to four. Okay, but let's ask the 3.5. What am I asking it? Oh. Can you give me the specific amino acid sequence for the protein encoding? Let's do like a restriction enzyme. That's actually that, that's actually what we're looking for. We're looking for like the sequence, the amino acid sequence of a restriction enzyme. Can you give me the specific amino acid sequence for the protein encoding BAM H1 restriction endonuclease? Yes, I can provide you with the amino acid sequence for BAMH1 restriction endonuclease. The BAMH1 enzyme is a type 2 endonuclease produced by the... It worked. Nice. There's the sequence. 
Okay. So if you want to quickly, instead of one of the, one of the things we have to do all the time is like go NCBI, make sure you click the right button, find the gene, click the right button, click the right button, click the right button. If you click the wrong button, you go to a different path to find like the protein sequence. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So apparently this is a very, very quick way. If you just have this open on your computer and you have a quick biotechnology question, it'll get you the sequence. I would always probably double check this, but two sources is always better than one. So this is a great, this seems like this is really good. Okay. Great. Let's go to our next one. Design PCR primers or a cloning strategy? Okay, so this is more abstract question. Let's say, um, please um, design PCR primers to use restriction enzyme cloning to clone the REC a gene from E. coli into P. bad A vector. Let's see if I can do this. To design PCR primers to clone the REC-A gene from E. coli vector, we need to consider the following steps. It gives you the steps. Let's see, obtain the nucleated sequence of the REC-A gene from E. coli. The sequence can be obtained from, yes, Identify the restriction enzyme sites in the PBAD that will be used for cloning the REC-A gene. Design PCR primers that will amplify the REC-A gene to incorporate the appropriate restriction enzymes. Wow, it's actually designing the primers. Wait, no, here's an example of a PCR primers that can be used. Yep. Wow. So it looks, if it's correct, this must be the start codon. Let's see. Okay, so first let's see. Let's see if it designed these primers correctly. Like, let's actually, um, we should test this. So the way that I want to see how it's designing them is I want to see NDE1. What's the NDE1 site? Cat ATG, let's mark that. Cat ATG. So it puts some random bases to the left of the restriction site, which is good. Otherwise, this would not work. So it already knows about that rule. It's got the correct NDE1 site. Let's check this for annealing temperature. And let's check to see if it blasts against anything. Hmm. Let's just quick blast this sequence against E. coli. And check to see if it's if it's hitting the right gene. While that's going, BAM H1 is C T C G A G. No, BAMH1 is GGATCC, that's BAMH1. So this one, it looks like it designed it incorrectly. This one, it's this one it's putting three bases to the left. In my experience, that's not enough. You want at least four. Um, interesting, I wonder why it put more here. This looks like a restriction site. I'm not sure how it's how, what rules it's using to choose on the left side of the primer. I should order these and test it and see if it actually works. Okay, let's see if it's designing it against the right sequence. Let's see if it pulls it up. This is the problem. Blast is now going to be so out of date. If this thing could access Blast, like this system is just so not user friendly. It's giving me these alignments against the chromosome. 
but it's always hard to find the exact spot. I don't know if I want to do it right now. It's going to slow down the video. Um, I think I have the rec A sequence. Let's get real specific. Let's just search rec A E. coli. Let's get the actual sequence. Give me the FASTA. Here it is. All right, let's check these primers. That is not binding anywhere in the rec A sequence. What is that mapping to? Okay, so. I really want to try to quickly detect here what the problem is. Let me try to run a quick blast. Align two sequences. I'll put the rec A sequence at the bottom. I'm gonna put these primers in the top. If any sequence matches, let's hit select somewhat similar sequences. Let's check these now. Why is that not working? Oh, this. Jesus. So these primers, so here's what the bizarre thing about ChatGPT is, is these primers are incorrect. I checked to see if these primers would match the rec A gene, and they don't. They don't match the rec A gene from E. coli. I don't know where it's drawing them from. So this is one case where you have to be like here's this is a elucidates one of the problems with chat gpt right now you have to be very careful about is when it gives me this answer when it gives me this answer the answer is extremely confident and it's written in a way where it's like this is definitive dogma truth like you wouldn't be able to tell that it was wrong but then when i actually looked into it these primers are not even matching the rec a gene the rec a sequence they're not blasting against anything in the sequence so so something about this is wrong it's it's being done inaccurately and it thinks it's correct. So that's a danger. Okay, so in this one, can it design PCR primers or a cloning strategy? I'm gonna say no, but it did give us sort of like a cloning strategy, kinda. And it seems like it would get better in the next generations. So what I'm asking some of my students to do in our biotech class is you have an idea for some kind of a biotech project, 
ask ChatGPT how it thinks you should do it, and then critique its answer and see if you can find any flaws in its logic. I think that's a good exercise. Okay, get a recipe. Can you give me the recipe for Luria broth? Triptone, yeast extract, sodium chloride, water, to one liter, and directions. Yes, and this looks right. Let's try PDA. Can you give me the recipe for PDA fungal plate media? Very nice. This looks correct as well. Okay. So to get a quick recipe, yes. Or maybe check something about a recipe. Again, two things is two sources is always better than one. Whenever people get new recipes or weird recipes from the web, I always want them double checked against a few different sources. So maybe ChatGPT is a great source for double checking a recipe. All right, pick a plasmid. Um, let's try this. I want to express um let's try fusion polymerase in an e coli recombinant protein expression vector which plasmid should i choose pets pbads so it's essentially giving good recommendations i would agree so pick a plasmid. It's giving good recommendations. You can trust it with that. Let's ask it to design a tag. What tag should I insert to be able to visualize protein localization of a transgenic, let's say, caryopharin in Drosophila melanogaster? Which epitope, I think you should be specific in your questions, which epitope tag should I insert to be able to visualize protein localization of a transgenic caryopharin in Drosophila melanogaster? Which tag provides the best um, signal detection for immunofluorescence in Drosophila? GFP, M cherry, and flag. Flag makes sense to me. So it looks like it's making good predictions. And it's giving a strategy. Interesting. So decide on a tag. Now it, it makes me think like, like I would never use this as a primary source of reasoning, but you could use it as a double check against what you were thinking. So try to generate your pipeline and then ask chat gpt and see if yours is different or see if you agree or disagree i agreed with this so it's working with that troubleshoot let's see my pcr is not working what are some troubleshooting tips Check the quality of your DNA template. Optimize PCR conditions. Check the primer quality. Check the annealing temperatures. I would have put that first. Check the PCR cycling conditions. Check the PCR buffer. So it is giving good, it's giving good. Right now it's giving good troubleshooting. Yes, but the order order of things that I would do first or second or third or fourth in the troubleshooting is wrong. Like I usually, if I'm troubleshooting PCR, I'm usually checking the primers immediately first and then running a gradient PCR to see like annealing temperatures. Okay. Weight of a protein in kilodaltons. What is the weight in kilodaltons of ubiquitin Protein, 8.6 kilodons. I thought it was seven. Mm. 
Hmm. Is there something I know? Something we can check it against to see? Now let's check Google. What is the KDA of Ubiquitin? 8.5. It's right. Okay. Good. Weight of a protein in kilodaltons. Yes. Calculate buffers. Buffers are always the hardest. I think I think ChatGPT is going to be a huge tool for people who have to deal with buffers in molecular biology. That's really kind of like a hit or, or a, a critical skill for biotechnologists. Let's see. How do I make a solution of um, three molar sodium acetate? pH 5.6. That's I think that's uh I think that's the buffer in ethanol precipitation. Let's see, let's see if I can get it. It looks like it's doing it correct. Let's just check it against salt. Um, what is the recipe for one molar sodium chloride? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So you can get recipes from it. That's amazing. Calculate buffer recipes. Okay. So here's 11 things. Here's 11 things you can use chat GPT right now for you in your biotechnology practice. Um, actually, sorry, 10. Be careful about PCR primer design. Be very careful about PCR primer design. It's it's not doing it properly at this point. Um, how would you use ChatGPT? Post it in the comments. If you want me to check something or triple check something or do another video about how I'm using ChatGPT, let me know about it. Put it in the comments. Have a good day. Think about biotech. Bye-bye.